Hey Periscopers, welcome back for John Wesley uh, Life Coach, Gospel of Mark, and this is session three. Um, sorry I'm a day late again, well actually last week I was like three days late, so I guess I'm doing pretty well. But uh, this is the time of year where things are really busy and it's um, this is kind of hard to keep up with things. So anyway, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 4, verse 34. And, uh, you know, I'm not going line by line. I'm not going verse by verse. So it's good for you if you just, before um, we get through with this or after we get through with this or ahead of time, if you just go ahead and read it. Um, anyway, so let's just dive right in. We're talking about the kingdom of God here. And Minor has... Uh, has some headings for it, and like I said, I use those. Uh, but anyway, um, like, let's give you a summary of kind of where we're going uh, throughout this lesson. It was probably the best, the first thing to, to do. Um, so we've got this summary of Mark. Let's talk about it this way. First of all, we've got Jesus go, going and calling 12 people to himself, calling 12 disciples to himself. Um, you got the in the next big session where you've got this crazy Jesus guy and he's got the devil in him. Um, we got a little bit that's kind of like a farming 101 session that Jesus gives, and then um, we have all these parables about the kingdom. You know, this kind of idea that you'll never see it coming. So let's go back and let's talk about calling the people of God. That's uh, section three, thirteen through nineteen. Jesus uh, takes these 12 guys up on the mountain, right? They're the guys that we call the disciples. Uh, it's important to note that the 12, when we talk about the 12 disciples, they're not the only disciples that Jesus has. Um, we know that he had up to 70, uh, and these numbers are important. Um, this number 70 is important. The, the number 12 is important. Anytime you're talking about the Jewish people and you hear the number 12, that's not just an accident. Um, these people were handpicked by Jesus. Uh, he gave them new names. Um, it's, uh, this, all this is reminiscent of uh, what we see in the Old Testament, especially Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Uh, 24, 9 through 11, Ch uh, Exodus says this, Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Ab Abihu, I'm really bad with Hebrew names, um, and the 70 elders of Israel, there's that number, 70, went up and they saw Israel's God. This is talking about after Moses had brought the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. Um, they finally get out into the wilderness and God tells Moses, he says, I want you to bring your elders, bring the people of God up and we'll have a meeting together. Um, and the, that, that quote I just read to you, that passage was um, 24, 9 through 10, the first part of, chap of verse 10. And that's out of the CEB, the Common English Bible. Um, it, it actually goes on to say that, interestingly enough, it makes a big point of, wants you to notice this, that God didn't harm the Israelite leaders, though they looked, um, though they looked at him. And uh, it says, let me read it, God didn't harm the Israelite leaders, though they looked at God, and they ate and drank. And so is, this is an important image, that God summons Moses, not just Moses, but the leaders of Israel, the 70 elders of Israel, invites them into his presence and has food and drink ready for them, provides them food, like sits down at table with them. That's a pretty important image. Um, and that was verse 20, chapter 24, four, verse 11 of Exodus. So you, you've got Jesus doing this act that's oddly reminiscent, at least to my mind, of what goes on with the story of the people of Israel and the deliverance out of captivity in Egypt. Um, so you got Jesus identifying a new Israel. He's calling them to himself. The Greek word there is, uh, and remember, I'm pretty bad pronouncing Koine Greek, is proskoletai. And that literally means calling to himself. He was in the act of calling these people to himself. He was calling them, where is he calling them from? He's calling them from out of the world. He's calling them from the rest of their life to him. Uh, we saw this last week when it talks about Jesus walking and calling his disciples uh, from the jobs that they were doing. Uh, they stop what they were doing and they come and they follow him. So, Jesus is the one calling us out of the world, and then that's interesting then too, because then what does that mean about the disciples? What does that mean 
uh, about us. If Jesus is the one that's doing the calling, calling us to himself, calling us out of the world, then we are the ones that are called out. Uh, this isn't in this text, but it's an important word, and it comes from the same root as uh, proskaletai. It's, uh, it's the word ecclesia, right? You hear this all the time. If anything, we talk about things pertaining to the church, we call it ecclesiastical, right? Um, this word, ecclesia, means the ones called out, uh, the ones called out of the world. The church, um, it, it, let me put it this way, a lot of times we read our new English translations of the Bible, and we'll see the word church, right? And in our minds, we think church is just a building, right? It's the big building, you know, with the steeple, and you know, like, well, there's the steeple, you open it up, there's all the people, right? Um, the word church is, is, a, is a European word that was brought in to stand service for this Greek word, ekklesia. Um, the word ekklesia, like I said, it means the ones called out. Um, the church, and that's why you hear preachers say, the church isn't a building, the church is the people. Well, that's true. Um, the church... The, it means the ones called out, the people that are called out, that God has called to himself, that uh, Jesus has called to himself out of the world, and we are called to him out of the world. Like I said, pros, uh, proskaletai and ekklesia, they share the same root. It's the, word, the Greek word kaleo, and it means to call or I call. Um, and, and all the only thing that changes are the prefixes. You've got pros proskaletai, which is to, and then you've got ek, which is out of. Um, we talked about uh, Jesus being cast out into the wilderness, right? Or Jesus casting out the demons. That word is ek balo, ek balain, balo. Uh, ek balo means I cast out, right? So, um, Jesus calls us to himself, and he calls us out of the world. That's an important distinction to know, and an important thing to keep track of. You are the one that is called out. If you are following Jesus, you are called out of something and into something else. Called out of the world and into following him. So, this leads to a good question. Jesus is doing this thing. He's calling people out of the world. He's calling them, giving them new names, right? That, um, like, like God did with the patriarchs. Um, not the patriots. That's a football team. The patriarchs. Um... Although that would be kind of a cool name for a football team. The patriarchs of Israel. These are people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And they all had, they had, God changed their names. Abraham was originally Abram, right? Even his wife, Sarah, Sarai, Sarah, oh, Sarah, never mind. Um, she gets her name changed by God. Abram gets his name changed by God. And you got this guy, Jacob. And he ends up wrestling with God, and God changes his name to Israel, hence the children of Israel. So Jesus is calling his disciples out up a mountain to have this special communal moment with God, gives them new names, um, and it had to have been seen as kind of provocative, I would, I would think. Um, you know, calling 12 disciples, to, you know, there's 12 tribes of Israel, calling them up a mountain, giving them new names, got to be a little provocative. So anyway, we get to the next session, uh, which is Jesus' family and the scribes. And his family says he's crazy, and the scribes say he's demon-possessed. Well, so we've got this call going out, right? Uh, you've got Jesus' family. They're fearing he's crazy. Uh, they see him doing all these things. They see him spending huge amounts of time with all these complete strangers. He's leading all these people around. He's doing things like leading people up a mountain um, that are being seen as provocative, so provocative that these scribes go out of their way to come in from Jerusalem to see what he's doing and what he's about. Uh, and they're worried for his safety. Um, and it says in the text that they show up and they call him out, right? Uh, he's inside the house teaching and preaching and healing people and just so surrounded and so packed in that he can't even eat. And so they they call him out. They're standing outside the door and they call him out to them. Uh, the scribes, they fear, but they fear he's Satan, right? That's the, what we're led to believe. They show up and they call him out too, but not in a good way, not like a, in a way that they show concern. 
Um, and also, remember last week we talked about the issue of honor and shame in society. There may, there's probably a little bit of that going on with Jesus' family too. They're a little concerned about how this looks for the family when the oldest is kind of going off the deep end. Um, so they call him out out of fear. The scribes call him out out of fear. And then, so you have this call, and then you have a response. Uh, Jesus responds to the issue of his family. He says, well, my family, he says, and the ones who hear and do the will of God, that's my family. Um, who is my family? Who are my brothers and my sisters? It's those that hear the will of God and they do the will of God. They hear and they see and they do. So it's, again, just like we talked about in the previous weeks, it's the importance of following through on what God has shown you. Like we talked about John Wesley's sermon um, when he says, you know, basically if you see and you know what the right thing is that God wants you to do, if you know what has to be done and you don't do it, that's sin. And Jesus says, you know, if, if, if you're wondering who my family is, um, I'm going to redefine that for you. It's not just whoever gave birth to me. It's not just whoever is related to me by blood. If you want to be a part of my family, Jesus says, you're going to pay attention to what God's doing, and you're going to pay attention to what he wants you to do and what he's calling you out of the world to do, and you're going to respond to that, and you're going to do what he asks you to do. Um, you know, it's the idea that you might even get it wrong, right? I think sometimes we don't do what we feel that we're called to do because we're afraid we're going to screw things up or we're going to get it terribly, terribly wrong so we don't do it. Um, and so we, you know, we're afraid to even move because we don't fully understand what we're supposed to do or fully understand what God expects. That's okay. Um, if, if you really, if you feel like you know what God is calling you to do um, and you, you don't fully understand, that's okay. Um, it's not the end of the world. Right? You're not going to ruin. Let me explain this to you. You are not going to ruin God's plans because you made a mistake or because you didn't fully understand what you were supposed to do at the time, okay? That's how that works. Um, it's not the end of the world. Um, that's in the book of Revelation. Uh, anyway, John Wesley has this time in his life after, you know, he had the debacle with Sophia Hopke that we talked about last week, and he comes back to England after being this failed missionary in Georgia, and the, at the time, the colony of Georgia, um, you know, he had these great big dreams when he left England for Georgia that he was going to be the person who would show up in North America and he would convert the Indians, all the Native Americans, and um, and save them for Jesus, right? And then he has this heartbreaking moment on the ship back, on the journey back to England, where he says, you know, I thought I was going to save the world. I thought I was going to save the, the Indians. Who's going to save me? Um, he's wondering probably like you might be if he's getting it right if he's going to if he's messed things up if he's ruined ruins god's has ruined god's plan um he over time he he deals with that uh but he he begins spending a lot of time with uh with people called uh some people call them Moravians. um and uh, another way that people kind of refer to some of the people that he was spending a lot of time with and doing ministry with, were, they, they were called quietists. And um, that, that has to do with the idea that they felt like you shouldn't do anything, um, any works at all, lest it look like you're trying to save yourself through your own works. So um, they, they, you were supposed to be quiet and wait on the Lord uh, to, to, to do the work and to save you. Well, this is 18th century England, this, the early 1700s, um, not even mid-century yet. And I don't know if you know a lot of stuff about what life was like then or what life was like in England in the 18th century, but it wasn't good. Um, people, there was, there, there was a lot of poverty, there was a lot of illness, there was a lot of sickness. Um, and Wesley is somebody who earnestly... Um, earnestly wants to serve God with all his heart and all his mind and all his soul. And in the midst of this, he sees children and women going hungry. He sees people languishing in prison for no good reason, um, wrongfully accused, wrongfully put there. And even if they are put there for warrant, um, the burden of, 
of the way that the, the, the prison system worked and the judicial system worked, they didn't have really any hope of ever getting out. And they would rot and die in prison for trivial, what we would consider trivial things. Um, and Wesley was, he saw this need and he honestly felt like we should do something about that. That God, if we see this, like we said, if we see this need and we see that that God wants us to deal with this, we should do something about it. Because if we're not, it's a sin. And the quietists wouldn't move. They they were so worried that um, anything they did might be taken as self-righteousness or works righteousness that they wouldn't deal with the problems they saw. And Wesley finally, he just had to break with them over that. Um, he couldn't see how you could claim to follow Christ and not respond to the needs in the world that you saw. You know, you know, for I was hungry and you fed me, that kind of scripture kept ringing over and over in his head. Um, it even gets to the point where, where Wesley, because of who he is and because of what he sees about God's will and what he sees in scripture and how he is interpreting scripture and what he's preaching about scripture and what he's preaching even about what it means to be a true, a real, altogether real Christian, um, He's ostracized from the churches in the Church of England. He he goes back to the parish church where his father was a pa was a priest when he was growing up in the Church of England, and is denied access to the pulpit. That's kind of incredible, right? Um, he, and he's excluded from all the pulpits this way because they didn't like his message. They thought he was crazy. Um, they thought uh, he was possessed. Sound familiar? Um, and Wesley's response to that, to that, especially at the church uh, where his father had been a priest, was to go out and stand on his father's tomb and preach to the masses. And we, and the great quote that we Methodists have, and when I say Methodist, I'm not just talking about the United Methodist Church, because this is United Methodist Campus Ministry, the Wesley Center, and I'm the United Methodist Minister, but the Wesleyan tradition, the Methodist tradition, is much larger than that. And um, so we have we have brothers and sisters in the Nazarene Church, the, the Wesleyan Church, the Free Methodist Church, goes on and on and on. Um, so anyway, he has this great quote where he says, Fine, you won't let me in, in the parish? The world is my parish. And he takes that very seriously and uh, spends the rest of his life making the world his parish. So that brings us to this issue of, of uh, calling, saying that Jesus has Satan in him. He um, says he casts out Satan by the power of Satan, is what the scribes say. And uh, Jesus' response is kind of like, that don't make no sense. You know, that's my best impersonation of, oh, brother, where art thou? Sorry. So he says, that, you know, that this doesn't really make any sense what you're saying. Are you listening to yourselves? This is kind of what he's asking them. Um, you know, so what the devil got into Jesus? That's our question. Jesus points out that that the, the fallacy of what the scribes have said, um, and we get this great scripture that um, you've probably heard and didn't even, may not even realize it was scripture. I bet if I say a house divided against itself cannot stand, you probably think Abraham Lincoln came up with that himself. No, he's quoting Jesus. He's quoting Mark. Um, this idea of that a house divided against itself can't stand. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If, if, if Satan is divided against, is against Satan, how can he stand against himself? Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. And uh, which kind of leads me to wonder if uh, Abraham Lincoln was saying something much deeper about the state of the United States and who we were and where we were heading than we were, might be actually noticing. But anyway, Jesus goes on to talk about a, a strong man. He says, you know, if you want to rob a strong man's house, you first you got to tie him up, you got to bind him up, and then you can do whatever you want. You can take all his possessions. And so my question there is, well, who is the strong man? And I think that may be the question that the scribes need to ask. Who is doing the binding up of the strong man who whose house is being plundered? Um, and it, I think this implies that the scribes are speaking more from stubbornness than, than any real conviction that they might have. They see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't repent. Um, Jesus' family doesn't seem to understand what he's doing. The scribes see what he is doing, but they reject him and the one who sent him. I mean, after all, if, if he's not casting out Satan, 
by the power of Satan, whose power is he using? And this goes back to where we've been previously. The quote, when Jesus is baptized, the, the voice from heaven that Jesus, hear, Jesus hears, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. Um, when he heals the demon-possessed person, um, or excuse me, um, heals the, the paralytic, well, anyway, he says, you are my son, um, sorry, he says, what is this, a new teaching with authority? That, that's what the crowd listening says, right? You, who is this, you know, like, what is this new teaching that actually has authority behind it, right? Um, this makes me think of, uh, the, the scribes make me think of the dwarves in C.S. Lewis's um, book, The Last Battle. It's the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia. It's where Narnia literally comes to an end, the actual place where the Pevensies go all the time. Um, if you've never read The Last Battle, it's a good read. You should probably pick it up. But there, there's this group of dwarves in that that um, always figure like they, they, they have all the answers and they can't be fooled. They know better. Um, there's no pulling one over on them. And at the end of the end of the story of The Last Battle, it's really sad because they're all sitting in this bright and glorious and brilliant new Narnia, right? This, the, the, like we talk about at the end of Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. This is the same idea. And somehow they've gotten into Narnia as Narnia always was meant to be. And they're sitting in the middle of this bright sunny field, but they've got themselves convinced that they're being lied to and they're actually sitting in the midst of a dark cave. And they sit around in a circle facing themselves with their backs to everyone else saying, yeah, this is a dark cave. I can't even see my hand before my face. You can't, you can't fool me. You can't pull it one over on me. Um, I think the scribes um, are a lot like that. And perhaps it's more the case that C.S. Lewis's dwarves are supposed to be a lot like those scribes. So that brings us to the parables. Um, the Greek word for that we, inter we translate as parable is paraboles. Um, and it means alongside of. It's alongside of for the sake of comparison. Um, and it, the, the parables have a lot to do. It's always this, this phrase. The kingdom is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. In some places, the kingdom of God is like. In other places. Um, and so we get this, this story about the sower who goes out to seed. And we have this story about the hard soil. And it's just like the scribes. You know, they refuse to listen lest they repent. Um, and I think it may be that they don't want to save at least by the kind of God that Jesus is talking about. So they're this hard soil. Um, the guy I talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, actually, uh, last week, I guess. Uh, Joseph Pieper. Um, he talks about in his book, um, The Four Cardinal Virtues, he talks about the importance of three aspects of our nature for how we become virtuous people, how we become good people. Uh, he talks about these words, docilitas, mem memoria, and solartia. Um, and docilitas just means it's kind of like the word docile. But it's not docile as in you're just laid back. It's docile as in you are open to being taught. You are open to to seeing the hearing the truth, right? Um, memoria is that you're open to seeing things the way they really are. Uh, you are you have an ability to do that. And solartia, or, or solartia, uh, not good with Latin either. Um, that means, it means acting. It means acting on what you've known and what you've seen. It means acting the way you're supposed to. Um, so that, keep that in mind. It's important. So you've got, um, and then you've got Jesus' family. And I think they're kind of, and probably the rest of the world too, they kind of represent this shallow soil, this rocky or weedy soil. They lack depth. Um, there's not much room for growth there. And many of Jesus' followers even end up abandoning him when things get hot. Um, and then you have the good soil. And going back to Joseph Pieper again, you know, these are the people that they're teachable. Um, they're willing to hear. They're willing to listen. Um, the people who are capable of seeing things clearly or seeing the things for the way they really are. Um, you know, they're not like those dwarves in the last battle. They, they're not believing that they have the answer and the only answer. They're, they can really see the truth of things. They can really see things as they are, as they're really happening. 
And then because of that, they go out and they do. They bear fruit. And this is what Jesus talks about at the end of this parable. You know, the, the seed that falls on the good soil, it bears huge amounts in return for what effort's been put into it. Uh, so you get the disciples, you get the you get parables, and you get all this talk about seeing. And this is, now we're on chapter 4, heading through verses 10 through 20. It talks about the kingdom of God is a... Um, is a fire hazard, basically. Uh, my dad radar went off when I read this. Um, we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about lamps, right? And we talk about lamps, and I think today we don't really get an idea, because nobody really uses candle unless you go to, like, Yankee Candle Company and you want your house to smell like pumpkin spice. Um, they didn't have that back then, right? What did, what do their lamps look like? Well, hold on a second. It was more like this, right? So this is kind of, this is an oil lamp. Unfortunately, there's no genie attached to it. Sadly, I know that because I tried. Anyway, but this is kind of, this is more like what their lamps look like. Um, it's meant to be lifted up. You put it up on a pedestal, right? So it can give light to the whole room. It's also because it's a fire hazard. Um, and they were keenly aware of this, I'm pretty sure. Because... Um, like I said, my dad radar went off. It, it, this will burn up anything you try to put over top of it. Or if you put it under anything flammable, like a bushel basket or a bed, a couch, a mattress, it's going to catch it on fire. Um, so let me give you an example of what happens if you put this put this under something, all right? So I'm going to light it, and I can move a little bit forward. And see there? Now we've got a flame. And uh, so um, let's... I uh, got something I can burn here. Well, I probably should no, That would be mean to Adam Hamilton. I'll just burn this scrap of paper. So anyway, this is what happened. Let's put this under a bushel basket. Yeah, probably not a good idea. No, got to close that up before the fire alarm goes off. So anyway, fire hazard. So, yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, and I think this kind of points back to where we were last, a couple weeks ago, when we talked about wineskins and making a patch out of new cloth and putting it onto an old garment. Um, the kingdom of God is is there to draw light. It's there to shed light on all the things around it so that you can see everything more clearly. Uh, you can see the truth more clearly, and it's um, going to destroy anything that competes with it and tries to cover it up. That's the point of the parables. They come alongside of the thing being spoken of. They shed light on a bigger subject. Um, I think you also have to want to understand them. Um, you know, kudos to the disciple. We think they're, we make fun of them. Jesus kind of gives them a hard time. But kudos for them for pursuing the answer to these parables that they, they were having a hard time understanding. Parables exist to help us understand the bigger subject of the kingdom of God. There are snapshots of the greater things. And it's kind of like Instagram, but with better filters. Uh, you know, our friends' great pictures that they send of, you know, if like you have a friend that goes to New York and posts all these incredible pictures of Instagram on, on Instagram of like New York City, and you look at them in comparison to where you are, and you're like, I want to be in New York City too. You know, these are, these snapshots are, par are pictures of the kingdom of God that we hold up in comparison to the world that we live in. And they, they shed so much light on the world that we live in that we look at the world we live in and we go, I don't want to live in that world. I want to live in this world, and I want this world to be more like this world. You know, it's the it's this light that shows you where where you are and where you need to be. You know, in the kingdom of God, it's an unexpected thing. It, it grows. It's just like this is the next parable about the, the the crop growing in the field. It just grows up before our very eyes. We almost we don't notice it growing, but suddenly it's there and it's ready for harvest. Um, it's it's hidden in plain sight. It appears to be an insignificant thing, like Jesus talking about the mustard seed. It's you know, and actually a mustard seed is not not necessarily the smallest seed. You know, we know that. Okay, let's move on. Um, you know, it's it, but it's this insignificant thing. You don't really pay attention to it, but and it gets planted somehow, and suddenly. You know, this thing that you didn't have great expectations about 
suddenly becomes this conspicuous thing that you're walking by one day and you notice this commotion of all the birds of the air just nesting in it. Um, that's an important image, you know, a lot of Christian imagery, biblical imagery, the bird, you know, if you're talking about see birds being drawn to something, especially God, it's an image of people. Um, you know, birds usually are representative, especially in church art, of the people being drawn to God, called to him, right? Call, him calling them to himself. And so you have this commotion of birds and of people that Jesus is drawing to himself. Um, and it suddenly it becomes this outstanding thing, a large tree. I don't know if you really understand what a mustard plant is, but it's not supposed to be a tree. That's the point of this parable. It's not normal. It's not like your daily experience. Mustard plant is a little pot herb that grows maybe three feet tall at the most, and it's not a tree. But something's going on, because suddenly this one is. Um, you know, it's not supposed to do that. It's not supposed to be big and huge and powerful. Apparently, either were people from Galilee, like Jesus. So, but that's how revolutionary things begin. They start off small, and suddenly, before you know it, the world has changed. So, next week, I'm going to cut this short now because I think I'm about to run out of battery again. Sorry. Uh, next week, you want to read Mark 4, 35 through chapter 5, 43, and a couple of questions to think about. When you read the text about the disciples next week, um, how do you read, how do you understand the disciples' fear and why do you understand their fear in that way? So, anyway, thank you for watching. And uh, this will be hopefully up on YouTube in a couple of days, if uh, assuming that it saved my camera roll and I have film to edit. Thank you.